uh, we have a membership class coming up September 13th. So if you're newer to the church or you're new here today and you are interested in joining the church, it'd be a great opportunity for you to sign up to learn more about the church and have an opportunity to join us if you'd like to. Um, you can check that out online as well and register for that. Uh, and then inside the bulletin, we got a little insert today that says Night of Prayer. Um, that's coming up. It's going to be September 13th at 5 p.m. right here in the worship center. There's just so much going on right now in our country and in the world right now. So we're just going to have a night where we just gather together and we just pray. And we pray for some different things going on in the world. We pray for our leaders, pray for our church, pray for our communities and, and, and everything else that's going on. And so it's just going to be a really great time just to gather together as the church and, and pray for a, a bunch of different things. And so we would love you to join us there as well. All right. Um, last but not least, um, exciting. We, I think I announced it was last week. Um, I talked about uh, Tucker and Jordan, our, our contemporary worship leaders who are not here again today. Um, she is pregnant. We announced that last week. And, uh, and that's really exciting. But uh, Tucker is going to be back with us next Sunday. So make sure you reach out to him. Tell him, hey, we missed you. Get over here. Um, no, we're really excited for him to come and, and back and join us. And so I just want to give you a heads up. That's coming back next week. So uh, I know we all missed him. He's awesome. All right. That's all I got. There's more things on there. Look it over, but let's pray and we'll get back into worship. Father God, we just thank you, Lord, for this morning, for the time that we just have to gather together to worship you, God. We thank you for, uh, for some cooler weather. We thank you that things are starting to look up for as far as uh, the cases in Arizona for this pandemic going down. We're excited about that. And God, we just thank you for all the blessings, Lord, that you've kept us uh, relatively safe here at this church, that everybody is good, and that we are just... Uh, have the freedom to come and to gather together and worship you today, God. I pray that you just open our hearts and minds as we dive more into your word and we talk more about this nation and uh, the, the family system that you've put in place. God, just help us to learn from you today and grow more in you. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. And as we mentioned, Jordan and Tucker are coming back, but I just want to say thank you guys for having us as the fill-in worship band. Personally, I've just experienced so much growth just finding myself in this position, and it's so encouraging to have a congregation that we can just bless the Lord together. So let's stand up and let's continue that singing Death Was Arrested. Sorrow and dead in my sin, lost without hope and no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in when death was arrested. Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace, so free. Washes over me. You have made me new. Now life begins with you. Release from my chains. I'm a prisoner no more. My shame was a ransom. He faithfully bore. He canceled my.
Darkness rejoices the ruin at last. But then Jesus arose with the freedom. Amen, amen. Isn't that so sweet that we get to worship together? Just salvation is so amazing. All right, next song we're going to sing is Oceans. And I think this song is a little bit of a throwback in the worship realm, but the words are just very empowering, um, just the encompassment of the Holy Spirit. So let's sing and let's glorify God together one last time.
Lord, God, your presence is enough for us, Father. Your love is enough because your love and your mercy and your power is perfect, Father. Father, we are less than perfect, and that's why we need a Savior. Lord, we need you in our lives, but that's also why we are eternally grateful for the sacrifice of Jesus. God, we just want to come before you and bless your name together and glorify you in all that we do, Father. I pray for radical intervention in our life that we will be able to glorify you in all that we do in thought, word, and deed. That is a tough task because we are dead in our transgressions and our sinful nature doesn't want you, God, but you loved us first. For that, we pour out our love and our praise and our adoration, Father. Thank you, Father. God, we love you so much. We pray that this message will edify us and lead us in sanctification so that one day we may stand before you and worship for all of eternity in heaven with you. Father, I look forward to that day. And as for now, we bless your name and glorify you. In your name, amen. Amen. And you may be seated. And can we give it up? Michaela is a senior in high school and she's leading our worship. Can you give it up for Michaela one more time? Thank you so much for everything. I'm going to slide these back just a little bit. Well, good morning, church. It's good to see each and every one of you. If you're watching online, we're glad that you are with us as well. My name's Bill. I'm the lead pastor here at Arizona Community Church, and we just want to thank everyone uh, for coming out and being a part of our service today. Well, we are in the middle of a series called Why Nations Fall, and we are looking at those key factors that have been the downfall of nations over the centuries, specifically the nation of Israel, but uh, we will talk about other nations as well. Um, but uh, I hope you've been blessed. Here's where we've been so far. Uh, week number one, we looked at this. Blessed is a nation whose God is the Lord. Um, we talked about those blessings that come when a nation has God in their sight and uh, when they obey his word, when they obey his word. And again, America was not started as a Christian nation. We were started as a nation that had religious liberty, depending no matter where, no matter what you believed. But we were a nation nonetheless that was heavily influenced by the Judeo Christian scriptures. And I have no doubt that that had a huge bearing on the heights that we have reached in this country. Um, God has blessed us because we have uh, trusted in his word in many ways in this country. Week number two, we looked at the secularization of America, and we've talked about the fact that there are intense forces coming against this country, seeking to uh, get us to be an ever 
increasingly secular country, but that was never the intent of the founding fathers. The, the, they wrote the constitution and the, the, the concept of separation of church and state is not in the constitution. Um, the government uh, that they established, our four founders established was to keep government out of religion not the religious values that are found in the scriptures out of government or out of public schools. They definitely wanted religion to influence government. They just did not want government to influence uh, churches. And then last week, we looked at the destruction of the family, and that was part one. And we looked at those forces that are coming against the family here in America. Uh, we looked at radical feminism, Black Lives Matter, and groups like that that are built on a concept of victimhood that are built on a concept of victimhood. Remember, Karl Marx, Marxism, what we know as communism. By the way, you want to know, I read something this week, you want to know the difference between socialism and communism? Yeah, communists, the difference between socialists and communists, communists have guns, socialists don't. And so you slide down this path of where we're going to, you become more social and then pretty soon you're communist, communistic. That means you have no guns, they have all the guns. But my point, back to this is, Karl Marx saw everything in terms of victimhood. You had the rich oppressing the poor, but you can take that same concept across the board where you have one race oppressing another or men oppressing women. It's the concept that there are those that are oppressing others and, we, and there's a, a victimhood. Um, and um, so we looked at that fact that radical feminism, Black Lives Matter, are promoting this idea that women are victims of oppressive men and they are oppressed in their marriages. And so we need to destroy the traditional nuclear family, get women out of their marriages. And that is coming against um, us and against our families, <clears throat> against our daughters are being taught this in the schools and not just at the university level. It's now at the high school. It's now in the middle schools. And yes, it is all the way down to the elementary schools as there is a ton of curriculum um, that is seeking to deconstruct what we call the traditional nuclear family and replace it, construct something else, something radically different than what we see in the pages of scripture. If you missed any of those messages, they are free online anytime. I encourage you to check them out. So again, last week we looked at those, um, those factors that are coming against the family um, from outside, from outside. Now here's the danger for us as Christians. As Christians, we can always sit here and point to all of these groups out there that are attacking us or that are coming against our beliefs. But you know what happens when you're constantly pointing your finger out there? Point your finger, three point back. Right here, see these three fingers, they're pointing right at me. So I gotta remember that every time I'm sitting here pointing, hey, this organization's bad or that organization is dangerous or watch out what they believe or they're on the move against us, I gotta remember that there's three fingers pointing back at me. Now I wanna say something at the outset of this message. Last week uh, and this week, we're looking at the traditional nuclear family and that's the nature of this particular sermon series. But that does not mean, and I wanna stress this, it doesn't mean that if you're a single mom or a single dad that your family is in any way less important or less significant in God's eyes. As a matter of fact, some of the best Christian people are single moms, single dads, raising Christian kids. And as a matter of fact, some, in many cases, the single moms and dads are doing it better than the traditional nuclear families. Amen? I seriously, I've met moms, single Christian moms and dads who are doing a phenomenal job of raising Christian kids. And so don't mistake that because we're so focused on the traditional nuclear family that I've forgotten about the significance, the importance of single moms and dads. You guys are doing a great job. You keep fighting the good fight. We are in your corner. We have your back. Amen? Listen, this is what's interesting. As a matter of fact, what is more important than the makeup of your family, what is more, there's something that's even more important than the makeup of your family. And that is what is holding your family together. Samuel Adams said this, religion in a family is at once its brightest ornament and its best security. What's even better than quote unquote, a traditional nuclear family is a family, regardless if it's a single mom, single dad, or whatever that family looks like, if that family has Christ at the center of it, if it has religion at the center of it, that's the most important thing, amen? So again, doesn't matter what your family looks like. If Christ is in it, you are right where you're supposed to be doing what God wants you to be doing. Praise God. The founding fathers recognized the importance of the family. And again, this goes back to last week, but I got to say it again. Why was the family so important to the founding fathers? Here's why. Our 
Government is built on the principle of self-government. We, the people, get to pick our representatives. We, the people, get to enact our own laws. We get to decide our own destiny. That's what sets the United States apart from so many other nations. We are a self-governing nation. And so the founding fathers knew that the family was critical in helping raising up future generations of kids that were well-adjusted, normal, healthy, noble, honorable, who could one day take the reins and govern themselves. That's why this is so incredibly important. And I, to, I told you last week, that is why it's, I, it's almost laughable to me. And I'm not sure that the younger generation that is advocating for socialism, because that's what the kids on the streets of Portland are advocating for, they are advocating for socialism. And before long, it'll turn into communism. And again, the, the joke is, it's a joke, but it's, it's true. The difference between socialists and communists is the communists take your guns. Socialism, you'll still have guns, then the communists will take it. But we're, they're advocating for this. What they're, what they're willing to do is give up the right to govern themselves, to let the government do it, because they think the government will help create a utopian society. Let me ask you a question. Do you think the government can do a better job of governing you than, than, um, than you can? I hope you don't believe that. I hope you, listen folks, whatever kids you have influence over in your life, whatever you do, train them to understand the significance of being a nation that, gov that, that is built on the principle of self-government and do not surrender that. Tell them not to surrender that. As, as good as our university professors are making socialism sound or the idea that let's give up our rights, let's turn the, the, our authority over to the government and let them figure out and fix our problems, you don't want that. You don't want that. Our founding fathers came from a, a country, from Europe, where that very thing was happening. They fled that, they came and they started a self-governing nation. Let's protect it at all costs, amen? amen? Amen, okay, I hope you're with me on that. Trust me, the government cannot do a better job than you can. They just can't. All right, where was I? I'm sorry, I went off there. <laughs> um, strong faith-filled families, according to the founding fathers, oh, produced a well-ordered society and a well-ordered society meant that that nation, whatever nation that is, had a limitless future. On a more personal note regarding family, Thomas Jefferson wrote this. He wrote it in his letter to Francis Williams Willis in April of 1790. Just so you know, I do all the research I can on the quotes I put up here so that they're not fake because there's a lot of stuff that is attributed to the founding fathers. I actually had a really great, great quote and I did research on it and it was iffy if it was said, so I left it out. But um, I've, I, I've tested these and I, I have confidence in putting them up here. Um, Thomas Jefferson said, the happiest moments of my life have been the few which I have spent home in the bosom of my family. Amen? We all can relate to that, right? When the holidays are rolling around, what do we want more than anything? I want to see my family. I want to be with my family. I don't want to be out working. I don't want to be out on the road. I want to be with my family. At the end of a long work day, where do you want to be? I want to go home. I want to see my wife. I want to see my kids. I want to be at home with my family. As a matter of fact, I did some reading on this quote and looked at the fuller context. And he was so burdened by everything that was upon him in founding this country. There was such a pull to be in politics and help everything that was going on. He just, that's why he longed. He goes, listen, as I'm sacrificing for this com country. And I am sacrificing so that we can establish a nation where we can govern ourselves. But it's coming at the expense of my family. But know this, he says, the happiest moments of my life are not anywhere other than when I'm with my family. That the family is critically important can see, be seen throughout the pages of scripture. Listen, you know what's fascinating? Is from Genesis, like all the way through the New Testament, time and time again, God has commands for mothers, fathers, wives, husbands, children, and he has so many commands and so many instructions because the family is so critically important. He knew it. For the nation of Israel to do uh, what they were going to do, they needed to be to gone together, bonded together, not only as a nation, but that nation was going to consist of tribes, which consisted of families within those tribes. So you have the 12 tribes of Israel, but within those tribes were to be strong families. And that was going to be the foundation for Israel's success so as I said last week, we looked at these outside forces that are seeking to destroy the family. Guess what we're going to do today? We're going to look at those inside forces that tend to destroy the family. And you know what those inside forces look like? Look in the mirror. It's you and it's me. You heard me correctly. Some of the most destructive forces that will come against your family, against my family, will come from within our own families. Last week, I mentioned that the role that feminism has played over the past 50 years in undermining the traditional nuclear family in this country. What we didn't talk about was the origin of radical feminism. Do you know where feminism started? In the Bible, 
The very first book of the Bible, as a matter of fact, third chapter, we read this. This is God pronouncing his curses after Adam and Eve sinned. Listen to this. This is one of the most significant verses in the Bible, but it's rarely taught on. Listen to this. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Then he says this. God says this. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. It's that last sentence I want to focus on just for a moment. When sin entered the world, things radically changed between Adam and Eve, between husband and wife. This is precisely the moment in history where the battle of the sexes began. A power struggle for the ages. Feminism was born. Chapter 3, verse 16 of Genesis. The end result would be constant conflict within the home between husband and wife. And if you are married or, ever, or have ever been married, you can say amen to that. Amen. Marriage is hard, is it not? It's like one of the hardest things ever. Let's just all be honest. Let's not, let's, let's not be pious today. I'm married to a beautiful godly woman and marriage is hard. It's one of the hardest things, commitments you will ever make, one of the hardest institutions you will ever enter into. Marriage is hard. And by the way, women, we're starting with you. I'm getting to the men. So just hold tight, okay? So just, I know you're like, all right, he's gonna beat us up today. Not at all, not at all. But instead of faithfully fulfilling her role as helper or helpmate, this is what Eve was called to do, to be Adam's helper or helpmate as God had originally designed. She would now struggle with this role and so would every woman after her. She would now be contending with her husband, being contentious toward her husband. Her desire would now be to dominate her husband and rule over him. What was beautiful and harmonious before the fall is now corrupted and contentious after the fall. And men, you got to know when to hold them and when to fold them. There's times that you say amen after I read a verse or say a concept. There's a time that you keep your mouth shut and now you keep your mouth shut. <laughs> but here, I want to speak to the men just for a second before we get to the men. For many men down through the centuries and up to the very present day and in this very room right now, it has been easier just to give in and give up, to surrender our God-given roles as leaders in our families and heads over our wives and surrender the leadership to them. We have abdicated our role as our leaders in our families, in our churches and in our communities. And women, you can say amen to that, amen? Listen, I, the, the godly Christian women I know, what they desire more than anything are strong Christian men. Strong leaders. Let me tell you something, men. I'm going to tell you right now, if you're, if you're single and you want to find a godly Christian woman, what she's looking for is a strong Christian man who's grounded in scripture, knows where he's going and knows what his role and his calling is from the Lord. Am I right, ladies? Tell me that you want that. Ladies, do you want to know, going back to the ladies, do you want to know one of the most frustrating things in all the world to a godly man that he will ever experience in his lifetime? It's a wife or a woman that seeks to dominate him and rule him. A wife who is contentious and argumentative to his leadership. A wife who constantly nags instead of helping, helpfully supporting her husband. That's why the scriptures say things like this. It is better to live in the corner of a housetop than in a house shared with a quarrelsome wife. <laughs> say amen at your own risk, man. Okay, got to know when to hold them and know when to fold them. The next verse we're going to look at has particular importance because some of you men have both. Better to live in a desert than with a quarrelsome and nagging wife. Some of you have a quarrelsome and nagging wife and you live in the desert, okay? <laughs> and I know that's funny and it is funny, but the truth is that the scriptures were written this way because it matters. It matters. Listen, Martha Washington, the wife of George Washington, understood that a woman's happiness had less to do with her circumstances and everything to do with her attitude and outlook for her life. She wrote this one time. She said, I have learned from experience that our greater part of our happiness or misery depends on our dispositions and not our circumstances. Amen? And the right disposition that will make all the difference in the world looks like this. You want to know what the right disposition looks like, ladies? Regardless of your circumstances, this was what the, what the right circumstance, this is what the right disposition looks like. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, even as Christ is head of the church, his body, and, his, and is himself its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives submit in, what's that word? Everybody say it with me everything to your husbands. Now I want to say right before this, 
It says that husbands and wives are to mutually submit to one another. We're going to get to men in a second. But women, one of the most frustrating things in all the world is a wife that is contentious and fights a man's leadership. I'm going to tell you right now, ladies, it is hard enough to be a man in this world today, to lead a family and have the calling to, to be a spiritual leader in the home, lead your families, raise godly children, earn a living and all that. It is terribly difficult. We need you in our corners. Men need you, need godly women in their corners supporting them. It means everything. The apostle Peter said it this way, women, your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Not that there's anything wrong with those things, but that cannot be your emphasis. What should be your emphasis is this, rather it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. They submitted themselves to their own husbands. Now I want you to look at verse four there. It says, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. See, we have taught women in this generation that they are victims. It's part of Marxism. Marxism, again, remember, there's an oppressor, there's a victim. And so we have taught a whole generation of women after women after women, men oppress you, you're the victim. Get out of your relationships, get away from men. We need to deconstruct the family because you are being oppressed. And so women play the victim. And as a result, we have raised up a a generation of women who are not content, who are disruptive, loud, uh, cantankerous. I turn on the news and I look at the rioters, half of them are women being belligerent and screaming on the streets that their rights aren't being demanded and that they're being oppressed. And this is the heart of feminism. It's in the Black Lives Matter movement. And yet it's just the opposite of what God calls women to do. Be content. A gentle and quiet spirit is beautiful in God's sight. There's no shame in that. And no, you're not being oppressed if a husband is over you and he is leading you and you're submitting to him. That's not oppressive. Don't buy that narrative. That is a false narrative. You understand that. Now, don't get me wrong. There are times in which women find themselves in abusive relationships. They need out and you get out. Don't hear me wrong. But we don't want to buy this narrative that is being promoted, that women are systemically being oppressed by men, specifically husbands, and that it is their right to fight. They should fight for their rights and be cantankerous, contentious, and do whatever they can to get out. No, Look at, I love verse five, for this is the way the holy women of the past put their hope in God, how they used to adorn themselves. This is how those women made themselves beautiful. Sarah in the Old Testament, Esther, and all of these women in the Old Testament that we read about, you wanna know how they made themselves beautiful? This is how. They loved God and they understood the role that God had given them and they fulfilled that role with a content heart, with all of their heart. And they were beautiful to their husbands and they were beautiful to God, amen? By the way, do you want to know how Adam and Eve would have related to each other before the fall? We don't have a lot of information about their marriage before the fall, but this is what it would have looked like. Eve would have willingly submitted herself to her husband, not just in some things, in all things. She would have done it with a glad and happy heart, a content heart. And I told you guys a story. I'm going to say it again for those of you that are new. When I was an undergrad 30 years ago, getting my degree in journalism, I was taking a class. The professor asked everybody, where do you see yourself like 10 years from now? A a gal over my shoulder, two rows over, right over here. When it got to her, she said, I want to get married. I want to um, be a housewife. I want to raise kids. I, I just can't wait. And the professor went ballistic. And the class started laughing and mocked her because she wanted to get married and have a family and raise kids. Because that is a second class standard to what the feminist movement is saying. That, that's oppressive. Why would you want that lifestyle? You're gonna be oppressed there. You need to set yourself free from that if you're truly gonna be a woman and reach your potential. And so the class sat there and mocked her. That was 30 years ago. By the way, we get a further description of what a beautiful woman looks like in the eyes of the Lord and to her husband in Proverbs 31, an excellent wife who can find. She is far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her and he has no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. Um, It's just a beautiful passage. Ladies, this is your high and holy calling. And the path you choose will not only determine the outcome of your marriage in many circumstances, it'll have an impact on your children. And as I said before, um, this country is depending upon us, you and me. And again, you don't have to be married to do this, but it is dependent upon all of us to invest in the next generation so that the next generation knows what it means to be noble and virtuous and know what honor is so that they can govern themselves one day.
Now, There is no doubt that the men listening to me right now love this idea of wives being called to submit to their husbands. And I'm going to tell you that men love this. You want to know why, women? Because when you're not around and we're together in our little Christian men's small group and the topic of women submitting to their husbands comes up, we always giggle and go, yeah, right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We won't do it when you're in the room, mind you. But the second you leave, we'll giggle and go, yeah, she should submit, you know. (laughs) But the reality, is, uh, the reality is that most men like this idea of women being called to submit to their husbands because we have a worldly and fleshly connotation of what that means. Trust me, I've seen many Christian men, as I'm sure you have, who have used this teaching to treat their wives in ways that are absolutely unbecoming of someone who bears the name of Christ. This is not a free pass for men to lord it over their wives or somehow put her in her place or to make her the servant of the household. That's not what this is teaching at all. Again, the Bible tells us to submit to one another as husband and wives. But here's what's interesting. Whenever I talk about women submitting to men, people get offended. Women get offended and men get offended. They're like, how da- especially in this day and age, it's like, how dare you say that women should submit to their husbands? It's the most offensive thing I've ever heard. As if... Women were given the harder of the two roles in marriage. You heard me right. I would argue that the Bible, what the Bible calls men to do in the marriage relationship is far more humbling, far more sacrificial than what the wife is called to do. You want to know what men are called to do? That's what you're called to do. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. To what extent did Christ love the church? He died for her. Listen, wives, you are called to submit to your husbands, but men, you are called to die for your wives. Amen? Amen. You are called to die for your wife. Again, I would argue this is a greater, a call to greater humility, greater servanthood, and certainly greater sacrifice. Yet many Christian men, like myself, will stand up and go, oh yeah, I believe I'll die for my wife. And I proclaim it with all this virtue signaling that I can. I will virtue signal just how wonderful I am and I'll die for my wife, yet I won't even open the door for her. And I treat her poorly in the home and I get on her when I don't think she's doing what I think she should be doing. I treat her horrible, yet over here I'll proclaim I'll die for her. (laughs) And don't judge me, men, because I know you do it too. This is the high and holy calling of every man. And by the way, if you don't have to be married to love women this way. Men, Christian men should be leading the way on how to treat women. When the national news comes on and it says, listen, this is how you should treat women, their reference should be the church, don't you think? They should go, if you want to know how to treat a man, look at how the Christian men treat Christian women. Not just their wives, not just their moms, not just their sisters, but they treat all women well. Amen? That should be the reference point. The news should be referring to you, me, men in here. I'm talking to the men. You and I are called to be that. We're the heads of our households. We are to be the spiritual leaders in our homes and in our churches and in our communities. And that starts with how we treat the the women that God has put into our lives, those precious gifts that God has put into our lives. We should treat them better than anybody else. Do I hear an amen? Amen. That wasn't very rousing. Got me concerned, men. Now, here's the temptation. Here's the temptation. And ladies, I'm going to fill you in on how men think. So this is going to be worth its weight in gold. But I have a feeling women think this way. But I don't think you think about it as much as we think about it. Here's how men tend to think. Here's what men think. Well, I will start loving my wife the way that I am called to. And not until she first submits herself the way that she's called to. Sound familiar? I'm not going to lay my life down for my wife until she first submits to me. And thus starts a vicious cycle of husbands and wives waiting for the other person to be godly before they will do what they are called to do. Sound familiar? Where are the amens now? Huh? (laughs) Come on, be courageous. Let me ask you a question, men. Who loved who first? Did Christ love the church first or did the church love Christ first? Yeah, yeah. We love because he first loved us. Christ didn't wait for us to love him. He didn't wait for the church to become obedient before he showered us with grace. We were disobedient, rebellious. Romans chapter three, there's no one righteous. No one seeks after God. No one does good. We all together have become worthless. We were in a state of worthlessness. We were a bride on the run from our husband and he sought us out. He pursued us with all of his heart. 
And in the same way, men, you are to take the initiative. You want to know what it means to be a spiritual leader? It means love your wife, even if she's not loving you the way you want her to, or that you think she should. You love her sacrificially, even to the point of laying down your life for her. That is your high and holy calling. And again, I say, before we cast stones at the feminist movement and the Black Lives Matter movement and the Marxist movement, everybody wanting to undermine the traditional nuclear family, we can spend all day pointing there. What about me? Am I being the leader, the man in the home that I am called to be, sacrificing for my wife radically every day in every way? Many of you know... Um, Abraham Lincoln, 14th president of the United States, shot April 14th, 1965. Um, what did I say? 1965? I did that on purpose to see if you were listening. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln was married to Mary Todd Lincoln. That's her. We know all about Abraham Lincoln. We don't know about Mary Todd Lincoln. She suffered from numerous physical and mental health issues during her lifetime. She had frequent migraines, which, exa which was exasperated by the fact that uh, he was shot 1865, April 14th, 1865. She got in a carriage accident five years before that in 1860, which just made everything worse. It compounded the problem. On, on top of this, she had a spending problem. <laughs> so men, if, you have a, if you're married to a wife that uses a credit card all the time, Abraham Lincoln can relate. He's your friend. <laughs> Yet, oh, by the way, uh, she suffered with depression for most of her life. Some historians think that she struggled with bipolar. That, that as they study her, they think that she had bipolar. Not an easy woman to be married to. Yet Abraham Lincoln sacrificially loved his wife and cared for her until the day that he was shot, April 14th, 1865. At one point, after the death of their son, Willie, Lincoln went as far as to hire a private nurse to help care for her wife, his wife while she was in grief. You know what's fascinating to me is Abraham Lincoln, we celebrate him for the fact of bringing the Civil War to the end, setting the, fr the slaves free, uniting the country, so on and so forth, as much as he could. All of those things are commendable, but you know what we don't commend him for and make him a hero out of? how he loved a wife that suffered. He was in a marriage with a wife that had issues, real issues, mental health issues, other issues, and yet he loved her. Listen, when we think of him as a hero, let's think of him on that level too, amen? Let's think of him on that level as well. You wanna know what I believe? That if men who call themselves Christians would love their wives this way, the divorce rate would plummet. The divorce rate would plummet in this country. And you wanna know what a, divorce, a plummeting divorce rate will do for this country? It will radically, and I mean radically, transform this country overnight. Now imagine if the women, and by the way, I want to just go back to this. If the men in this country, if the men in the church would just treat all women with a sacrificial love as if they were our sisters in Christ, um, it would transform this country overnight. Now imagine if the women who call themselves Christian responded to their husband's sacrificial love by humbly submitting themselves to their husbands, seeking to do good. Stop, and instead of fighting him and being contentious towards him, becoming a champion. Imagine a husband and a wife being best friends, being the best allies. Not only would the divorce rate plummet, you know what would happen? Marriages would thrive. Marriages would start thriving in this country. Now imagine what would happen in a country where marriages are thriving as God would want them. George Washington said this. He said, I've always considered marriage, this is so true, as the most interesting event of one's life, the foundation of happiness and misery, or misery. He, he's, he, that quote is stating what I just said. Marriage is hard. Marriage is incredibly hard. If you're here today and you've never been married and you're, gonna, you're planning on getting married one day, you know how hard marriage is. You, I mean, you have no idea how hard marriage is. It's hard. It's hard. It's one of the greatest joys in life, don't get me wrong, but it is very hard. But you know what's interesting about this quote? He's absolutely right. Marriage is difficult, and it can be a source of happiness and misery. But you want to know what's interesting about this quote? Here's what's interesting about that quote. It is within our power to make our marriages either a source of happiness or misery. It's within our power. As husbands and wives, folks, we do not have to wait for the government to give us permission to make this happen. We do not wait, need to wait for more laws to be passed in order to make this happen. You and I have it within our powers to make our marriages a source of either joy or misery. And we can sit here and say, well, the feminists are making my marriage miserable. And this group over here and this group over here is making my life miserable. You can point your finger all you want, but folks, we 
have to, in the church, stop playing the role of victim, right? We're not victims here. We live in the greatest planet on the, the greatest country on the face of this planet. We have more luxury, more access to everything good in this country. We in this country, men and women, Christian men and this, women in this country have no excuse to play victim in our marriages. We either do what God has called us to do or we're not. But if we're not doing it, it's not because we have been somehow put in this position of, again, being a victim. Now, let's take this one step further. Imagine a country where divorce rates are plummeting Marriages are thriving. Imagine what that would do to the children of that country. Now, you might remember in week number one, in the first sermon series, Blessed is the Nation Whose God is the Lord, we looked at Psalm 144. And in Psalm 144, it describes what a blessed nation looks like. And one of the foundation, foundational principles of a blessed nation is strong sons and daughters, strong youth. May our sons in their youth be like plants full grown. Our daughters like corner pillars cut for the structure of a palace. Okay, so that's what we learned. A blessed nation has strong sons and daughters. Listen, I have no doubt that many of the problems being exhibited in Portland and in Minnesota, these riots are being led by and large by our youth of our country. A lot of these would disappear overnight if they were raised in homes where marriages weren't just surviving but thriving. Now, again, back to single moms and single dads. You do not have to be in a traditional nuclear family to raise great kids. And I said it before and I'll say it again. Some of the best, strongest, most awesome, independent kids that I've ever met in my life have been raised by single moms and dads. You are heroes. You are fighting the good fight. Keep doing what you are doing. And again, the the, the intense focus on the traditional nuclear family right now is just the nature of this. I'll speak to that, to single moms and dads another day because you truly are heroes. But I have no doubt that much of what we see happening. By the way, if you're thinking about going and getting a graduate degree, I have a great doctrinal thesis for you, doctoral thesis for you. And that would be to study the family life of the rioters, to to do a case study of, do a cross section of the rioters in Portland and Minnesota and find out what type of families they grew up in and what happened. I guarantee you, I guarantee you, you're gonna find a lot of dysfunction, a lot of broken families, a lot of hurt. But children don't get a free pass. We're not going to make children's victims here, right? Because that's what we can do. That's what Marxism does. It makes victims out of everybody. So we can say, well, parents have done a bad job of raising their kids. So therefore the kids are victims. Not necessarily. Listen, kids are responsible for their actions. How do I know that? Because the Bible says as much. Part of the attack on the family that is coming from within is coming with children who are being tempted by Satan, by their professors and by many others to disobey their divine calling to obey their mother and father. Amen. Listen, folks, the importance of children honoring their father and mother in the, in the family unit cannot be stressed enough. The fifth commandment of the 10 commandments stresses this honor thy father and mother, the 10 commandments, uh, Exodus chapter 20, Deuteronomy chapter five, both lists are the same 10 commandments. The fifth is the same obey, honor, Uh, Obey and honor your mother and father. As reiterated in the New Testament in passages like Ephesians, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, for this is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. As there is a divine order that God has established in the marriage between husband and wife, so there is a divine order that God has established between children and parents. Children are to obey their parents and we will not let you play the victim card. Amen? Amen. And that's important, guys. Do not let your children play the victim. Thomas Jefferson said this, if the children are untaught, their ignorance and vices will in the future life cost us much dearer in their consequences than it would have done in their correction by a good education. In other words, he's saying if we properly educate our children, and by the way, education for him, for the, for the founding fathers, didn't just happen in the public schools, while it certainly did. It primarily happened in the home first. If they were getting a good education in the home, it would, co- it would save us a ton of trouble down the road. That's what he's saying. If we, if we do it right now, we're, we'll be better, better off later. But if we do it wrong now, we're going to pay for it later. We're going to pay for it later. Folks, a good education starts in the home. By the way, do you want to know one of the main places where children have been taught to disobey their parents, to disobey their elders and to treat their elders with with just contempt? In the churches across America. 
in the churches across America. Churches across America have told the older population, you don't matter anymore. You do not matter anymore. And instead of honoring our elders, we have pushed them out of the very churches that in many cases they have founded and built, built with great personal sacrifice. That's what we've done. And we did this all while the youth looked on. By the way, if you turn on the riots, what do you see? You see the rioters. What are they doing to the elderly that they find on the street? They're pouring stuff on them, knocking them to the ground. There's no respect for their elders. Where has that come from? Instead, instead of honoring, our, it's, it's come part of it's from the church. We're telling our kids in the universities, you are a victim. You are a victim of you know, capitalism. You're a victim of your parents. You're a victim of a system that's going to oppress you. And so children and people, we send our kids off to university and they come back the victim going, oh my gosh, woe is me. Everybody's against me. They're fighting against everything instead of submitting as the Bible calls them to. And then they come to church and we tell them, we tell, we, instead of telling them, hey, honor your parents, your mothers and fathers and your grandparents who helped build this country and build this church that you're in. We're telling the parents, get out of here. And the grandparents get out of here. And we make everything about the kids and we only feed their narcissistic tendencies. We only feed their narcissistic tendencies to see themselves as victims in this generation. Then we took these very same churches and we turned them into places of entertainment where we addressed felt needs instead of calling our children to radical repentance and obedience and faith in Jesus Christ. Children are to our, or obey their mother and father, folks, and nothing less than that should be the standard in this country. But this is how bad things have become in this country. Our children and our youth are so lost that the idea of them obeying us almost seems out of the question. How do we even get these kids back? Now, it doesn't mean that parents get a free pass. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Parents are not to to lord it over their parents or over their children or to, to raise them in a bad way. We are to raise them in the instruction and discipline of the Lord. Now, what I'm about to say, I'm gonna wrap things up here, so just track with me. I don't care if you're a mother, a father, grandparent, great-grandparent, or even if you're none of those things, if you have influence over children, listen to what I'm about to say, it's critically important. Your highest calling for those children and those youth that you have influence over, your highest calling, your greatest priority is to first and force, first and foremost, raise them in the instruction and discipline of the Lord. But if we are not careful, we will let athletics, academics, politics, or something else take priority in our children's lives. And I'm afraid that we have done this. Do you want to know one of the things that I think God is doing through this pandemic? He's destroying idols. And do you want to know one of the idols that he is destroying that I thought could never happen in this country? What's one of the greatest idols in this country? Sports. sports. It is sports. And it's an idol in my life. And I, and I, every day as a pastor who, te- you know, on Sundays I have church, I'm like, people aren't here because they're watching sports. And I'm going, Lord, there's a, they say the fastest growing religion might be Islam or Christian. Is, there's debate. No, the fastest growing religion in this country is sports. And I didn't know how God was ever going to topple that religion. But he basically said to me, Bill, hold my coffee. I'll be right back. <laughs> he is destroying the idol of sports. Here's why that's significant, guys. Sports has been compromised. Many politicians are politics, politicians and po- politics has been compromised. Our universities and school systems by and large have been compromised with godless ideologies, false narratives. Now sports has as well. Listen, what I'm about to say, I say it to everyone. Don't support professional sports that are contributing to the false narratives that are being produced in this country. False narratives such as all the police are racist. That's a false narrative. That is a false narrative. And yet basketball players, the NBA, and uh, MLB, and other such organizations are supporting that narrative that all police are racist. There are also, these sports organizations are now black, backing groups like Black Lives Matter that are celebrating victimhood in this country. Folks, those are false narratives. Those are absolutely false. And there's nothing wrong with calling it what it is. Not all police are racist. Are there... Are there police that act racist? Are there bad police? Of course there are. There's bad pastors. There's bad teachers. There's bad everybody. But that doesn't mean that there's systemic racism within our police departments. Not at all. And to say that all police are racist and we need to defund them and kick them out, that's tragedy. And that is a false narrative. Don't buy it. Also, don't buy the narrative that, that the police are oppressing people or that, other, that people are being systemically oppressed in this country. That's not true. Can we make things better in this country for for all people? Certainly. 
I just read this week that when, our, when, when even our own founders wrote the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, they set the bar up here and even they didn't live up to it. It has been 200 years of working to get up to the standards that they set. So even they couldn't live up to the standards they set. We're not there yet. I get it. We have room to improve in this country. But a false narrative is being pushed. A false narrative is being pushed in which people are being oppressed. The, pol the police are racist. All the police are racist. It's a false narrative. Don't support anyone that supports that narrative. And that includes sports. Amen? Anybody with me on that? If you love sports as much as I do, you would be shocked that I'm saying that. I got rid of my... Um, Got rid of my ESPN account. I unfollowed all my favorite sports guys on Twitter. I want them to know that they have lost my support. Until they change their narrative to what is true, I will not support them and I hope you won't either. Listen, folks, I'm gonna finish with this, sorry. If, we're if, our, if we are confused on the priorities for our children, they will be confused on their priorities for themselves. We must raise them in the instruction and discipline of the Lord at all costs. Is there hope for America? I've said it before, I'll say it again. I have no idea. I really do not know. A lot of it will hinge on the, the success of the family moving forward. Our values need to reflect this and our laws need to reflect this. And by the way, when I say on the, what happens to the family, I mean the traditional nuclear family. Listen, I don't care what side of the aisle you vote on, Democrat or Republican, you should only vote for politicians who understand that it is the traditional nuclear family that will be the future of this country. You have to vote with your values. If the politicians you are supporting are supporting, um, are, are radically advocating for the deconstruction of the traditional nuclear family and, and celebrating all these other types of families and lifestyles, that is a politician you should not or cannot vote for. And I don't care if they're Democrat or Republican, where you land, vote according to the scriptures. Listen, our country was built on the principle of self-government. And the founding fathers understood to, to, for that to succeed, we needed to be united as families, grounded in faith, raising up godly generations to come. And so I finished with this question, whether you are a mother, father, husband, wife, or child, are you faithfully fulfilling your God-given role in your family? Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, we come before you this day. And God, we understand that the family is under attack in this country from without, but also from within. And God, forgive us, forgive me of the times that I have not been the husband I have been called to be, the son that I haven't, that I haven't been called to be. God, um, I can point fingers at everybody else who is brought harm to the, to, to the family, but God, I stand probably more guilty than everybody. So God, let me with just all my heart embrace what you have called me to be with, to my wife, to my kids. And God, I pray for that for every man in this room and every woman in this room, God, that we embrace our roles. God, be obedient to you, no matter the cost to us, trusting that as you go before us, um, God, you'll take care of us every step of the way. So we love you. We thank you. As we leave here now, God, embolden us. Let us be lights in this world. And we pray these things in your son's name. And the church said with me, amen. God bless you. See you guys back here next week. God bless.